Ladies and gentlemen, our next session, Detroit, an opportunity for inclusion and economic prosperity is sponsored by PNC Bank. Please welcome President of the NAACP Detroit Branch, Reverend Wendell Anthony. Vice President of Economic Opportunity and Markets for the Ford Foundation, Xavier de Sousa Briggs. President Crossroads Consulting and Communications Group, Sheila Cockrell. Founder of the Social Club Grooming Company, Sebastian Jackson. And returning to the stage to moderate the discussion, the Chief Executive Officer of Starfish Media Group, Soledad O'Brien. Welcome, everybody. It's such an interesting idea, I think, looking backwards before you can really move forward. So I want to begin, if I may, kind of in the middle, which is what lessons were learned from the summer of 1967. And when I say learned, I don't mean noted or written about. I meant like what were actually learned and moved forward in in some kind of specific and tangible, life-changing way. Well, if, since I'm closest to you, <laughs> uh, first of all, let me acknowledge the chamber for having this session. And I want to start by remembering one who would be here if he were alive, and that is Ron Hall. Uh, I just want to pause for 30 seconds just to acknowledge him, a great man who would be a part of this, who reflects what we're talking about. Now, having acknowledged that and said that, I think it is the best of times and the worst of times. It is the best of times to the degree that we have made some progress but it is still not quite there yet. Uh, 67, 68, 69 presented a lot of opportunities for growth and development. There were various studies that came about to reflect what caused the rebellion, the riot, the uprising in the summers of 67 and 68. Over 125 cities went up in flames. A lot of it had to do with what was determined at that time, a lack of inclusion. The current commission report articulated that it's unfortunate that President Johnson did not adhere to the commission that he had, in fact, developed to do that. Uh, it really concluded that white racism, uh, white exclusion of minorities was at the root cause of what we saw in cities, economically and socially and politically. And so we see that even 50 years or 60 years later, uh, another commission through President Obama the Police Commission on 21st Century Policing, has repeated some of the same things, the same variables that we saw back then. That's not to say we have not made progress, because we have. But the challenge is not just in terms of business development in the core city, in downtown areas. The challenge for us is what we do in the neighborhoods, what we do to make the economic opportunities more palatable and more accessible to more people who can benefit from so we can quell and lessen the kind of challenges we saw in 67 and 68 and 69. If commission reports are repeating themselves, then I'm Absolutely. going to say, okay, on that front, then they're not learning the lesson. Sheila, what do you think? Well, I think, I think one of the, um, I think there have been a lot of different lessons learned, but I think that at core, we still in this region don't really address the way that race is still the 900 pound gorilla that sits in the middle of conversations between city and suburbs, between black and white. It's part of the narrative, the current narrative, that is, is what's going on in Detroit now for one Detroit or two Detroit. I think part of it is we all need to, and I do think, you know, to sound, I mean, I, my, I am on the older end of the spectrum now, but if we don't understand our history, we can and often repeat it. And even sometimes when we do understand it, we still go ahead and repeat it. But I think understanding what really happened in 1967 is important. And the different narratives, I mean, there's a city narrative, a suburban narrative, a black narrative, a white narrative about what happened there. I think the thing we need to understand is that in 1967, there was a uh, civil rebellion. There was a rebellion against two things, in my opinion, against a, a police department that was out of control, whose racist behavior toward uh, pe to black, to, to, toward black people that began in the early 60s, uh, whose, whose job it was was to maintain at that time the division between the inner city 
and the rest of the city was to, to maintain order, and then secondly, it was lack of job opportunities, the lack of opportunities for people of color to get real jobs that made living a full and rich life possible. That's something we still have, are facing here today. Could I jump in and some? On, on one hand, you know, what do we learn from other communities around the world? I would submit that one thing we learn is you don't need to agree on just one version of the past, right. but you need to be jointly committed to learning lessons from the past, to embracing the cautionary tale that's there. And in addition, to pick up on the point about downtown and the neighborhoods, I mean, one of the things that's so striking about where Detroit is today and what's been made possible by just the last couple of years and the bankruptcy resolution and so on is Detroit is growing again. It is fantastic to be able to face up to the challenges of inclusive growth right. or equitable development as opposed to managing decline, which is an entirely different problem. But at the same time, I mean, you use the word rebellion. There are people I talk to who call it an out-and-out -out riot. Others will say it's an uprising. To me, those words are not specious, right? They very much frame how someone has told themselves the story of something that, that changed this city very dramatically. Yes. Can well, you bring all these different perspectives together to bring people to a place where you can move forward cohesively well, as a group? That's the challenge, Soledad. And to somebody who's fighting for freedom, he's a liberator. To somebody who's fighting against it, he is an agitator. He's a destroyer. It depends on what side of the fence you're on. And certainly, I agree that uh, there is growth and development in Detroit. I think we are doing some wonderful things, but I pause when I look at the further development in our neighborhoods. I'm in the trenches every day. I hear it. Folks sitting out there hear it. I hear it from business people. I hear it from the local community. There are some great things going on in Detroit, no question about it. And you can see those things. But the real test of the viableness of our city and the vitality of it is the inclusiveness of all of its citizens. You can't build a moat around downtown Detroit. You can't build a moat around Midtown. You gotta, you gotta build a bridge. I think the mayor's attempting to do that. I think there's some great things, but we still have economic challenges. Sheila is absolutely correct when she talks about the, the police department relative to what happened in 67. We still got evidences every day with black people around, that's why you have the Black Lives Matters movement. We, we're, we're glad that in Detroit we have a police department that is seemingly understood some of that, where the police chief is in the community, is trying to engage. That's, those are recommendations that came out of the Kerner Commission. They came out of the police report for the 21st century. The question is, do we have the will? After we do sermons on Sunday morning, we have the benediction. The question is, what you going to do after the benediction? This is uh, the sermon here. What's going to happen when we do the benediction, when you say, thank you all for coming, and we go back to Detroit and our various communities? How do we implement those things that we're suggesting. So, are. Sebastian, you sit in an interesting position yeah. as a person from the neighborhoods who yeah. also is a, a business owner yeah. and an entrepreneur. Yeah. So then what follows the benediction? What is that action moment that actually makes change to well, move forward? For me, I've used entrepreneurship, right? You know, I, I think uh, I've chose the barbershop as a tool to look at, you know, social, impact as well as economic impact, right? Creating jobs and having conversations that are uncomfortable. Uh, I made a very conscious decision to hire all different types of people because I think the haircut is a place, uh, the barbershop is a place uh, providing a service that you know, a lot of people need. And in hiring black people, white people, gay people, straight people, we're able to attract people that look just like them and have those uh, conversations in an environment that is, is, is viewed as a safe environment. So we're able to kind of break some barriers in a very non-invasive way. Uh, and I think we need to put more places like this, right, uh, uh, that, that really breed culture, restaurants, uh, dance, you know, food, uh, 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 music, uh, create places that bring people together from all different walks of life. And I think having conversations in those places uh, can lead to uh, more barriers being broken. And I think that's what the future looks like for, for, for us. To me, there, I mean, there are two really important, at least two really important stories in what you're saying, Sebastian. Because on, on one hand, you know, we saw Detroit uh, lag the rest of the country for many years in local business starts, in local entrepreneurs learning how to succeed and being able to succeed and having opportunities. We see some of that turning around now. Revan's absolutely right. It's not being equally shared. And that's why I use this phrase, equitable development. You can't assume one tide will lift all boats. Absolutely. You've got to be very intentional about it. Mm -hmm. Um, 
but it's more than business. It's, in fact, more than livelihoods. It's also places to come together. Yep. It's places for dialogue. Yep. It's places to move ahead as one city, yep. uh, not two separate and apart. Right. You know, and I think, I think that there's, uh, to put, put, put what Reverend Anthony was saying, I do think there's a, a material and significant difference in the last, uh, since, since Mayor Duggan was elected, in the, the legitimate commitment of the business community to reach not just downtown. The narrative for years, it's, it's, an, it's the, you know, the Detroit story. What's changed? The neighborhood versus downtown. The, the, the session that I was just in before this, uh, before this one, where there was where's the, the uh, discussion with, uh, about creating a learning um, a structure that gets kids in this Detroit high schools from uh, in, in a position to actually learn career training and have an opportunity to, bo to both go to um, uh, community college or to go to a four-year college. Things are, this, this didn't, I've been, I've been around here 68 years, trust me. I was, that was not what was happening after 67 uh, in the early, in between 67 and 72 and onward. Those things have materially changed. The, the people get that the city doesn't succeed. Mm -hmm. Corporate leadership gets that the city doesn't succeed if it only happens downtown and midtown. I mean, the work that's going on, on with the, uh, the Peter Cummings uh, group that are, are reaching out into Brightmoor, into West Village, into Livernoy, Six Mile, this is stuff that hasn't happened in the past. The question is what and keeps I would it certainly, going. And I would agree with that. I think I've acknowledged that. And when I used to get regular haircuts, uh, <laughs> well, since I don't do that now, I mean, the, the best place to have conversation is at the church. Uh, and since I happen to be a minister, we have oh. service Sunday morning at 9.30, <laughs> every Sunday. I was hoping Everybody you'd get a plug in, in so everyone but would let, make But let me just say this, you are, you're correct, and I want to acknowledge the business community. Some of them are doing a great job. DTE is doing some phenomenal things. As a matter of fact, they're creating a model in terms of procurement, how you do business, how do you work with your customers mm -hmm. who are having challenges, a whole lot of business need to look at the DTE model and implement that for yourself. It's a great one. But I would also say it is not enough. It is not to the degree that it can be. And as an advocate for, for folk, I want to make sure I'm, I'm putting that on the table. Mm -hmm. I want to salute the business as an example that have stepped up on the educational issue. A lot of businesses, some who are sitting right here, have written letters, have tried to lobby this intransigent uh, House of Representatives yep. on the issue of educational enhancement for Detroit, as if somehow Detroit is an island in and of itself, mm -hmm. if somehow Detroit created the mess that it is in right now fiscally when it did not. For the last 16, 17 years, Detroit has been under emergency managers. And Detroit is not seeking a bailout. The state has to bail out itself because the state created this mess. However, there are businesses that have stepped up, written letters, done press events. So we acknowledge it. We thank you. However, it is not enough. When we start thinking that we've done enough, then we might as well quit. We have not. And, and, and I have not preached my best sermon. I've had some good ones. But I better come up with a, another better one right. in order to maintain what I got. So I'm simply saying that we want to work with businesses, and we, we support those businesses who are supporting us. But it's one thing to be philanthropic relative to doing some food, doing some scholarships. It's another thing to be participatory mm. relative to your procurement practices, to your senior management levels, to where you do your investments, to where you have uh, uh, some, some sort of uh, packs in the community where you do development, where you do training, where you do participation in business development. A lot of businesses say, well, why don't you all send us a program or a proposal for what should happen in your community? Well, small businesses and community folk don't have those kind of resources. You have resources, you have people that look at the country and say what's working in certain areas. Share that with local communities, small business people, so they can do what they're saying. In 2012, you talked about hope to be restored relative to this conference. Another year, you talked about inclusion relative to the economic situation. Another year, you talked about cutting up the economic pie so that more people could get a slice of it. Well, we're still talking about the same thing today. That does not mean we're discouraged. I'm encouraged. I just want to encourage others to do what they say they will do and have the will to make a significant difference. If we have the will, hmm. if we have the will to make a difference, we can make a difference. Do you think there's been a shift in a mindset? <laughs> I'm glad you're right next to me, because I feel like I can <laughs> grab you when I need to. He's preaching um, from the seat I love it, I love it. Um, do you think that there's, and not just within the corporate community, but maybe in individuals as well, um, a will to believe that actually in this community, you're going to succeed or fail together. Will you allow me to make one more point about the business community? Absolutely. You then you have to it? answer my question. Of course. 
Um, I couldn't agree with Revan more, and this is another way in which Detroit is a window on the state, on America, and even the wider globe. It is one thing to talk about inclusion or to say you care about inequality as a philanthropic proposition. It's another to talk about it as a business proposition. And one of the things that we see as a trend, it's very nascent, but it's got momentum to it around the world, is moving into these questions of the core business model. Who do you buy from? Who do you employ? What talent do you develop locally? Not just importing it, but developing it locally. And where do you invest? Um, consumers are also a part of it, by the way. Responsibility we take to spend our money or invest our money in a way that's consistent with our values. Mm -hmm. There is a movement afoot. It's actually worldwide. So these questions of procurement, again, basic business practices, the unsexy stuff, getting right. that right is huge, and talking this through is a business proposition, not just a charitable proposition. Right. I just wanted to understand. And, and so then my question fits in perfectly. Do you see a real shift, not only in the business community, but in general, of people feeling like, if the analogy is that this is a boat that, and often we say, well, the, the hole in the boat is not at my end, so I'm good. You know, but of course we all know that a hole in a boat anywhere is going to be problematic down the road. Do you feel like there's a shift there? I'll confess, and I'll just take 10 more seconds here. If you look at today versus 1967, mm -hmm. and you look at public attitudes, on one level, racial tolerance, in spite of what plays out in the evening news, racial tolerance overall, way up. Some of that is people changing their minds. Some of that is generational change. Yeah. But it is really important in America. I think you've seen many signs of that. But what has declined, actually, over that period is people's sense of responsibility, of connections to inequality, to changing it, let alone to government being a part of changing it. That actually declined after the 1960s. And I think what we've seen in just the last couple of years is the beginnings of a turnaround in that of people feeling inequality is a real problem, Republicans and Democrats agreeing it's a real problem, and it's something that needs to be solved and we need to step up. But, but so that also, there's this, there's this misnomer that we live in a post-racial society, and that somehow since Barack Hussein Obama had become president, everything is good now. Well, that's not necessarily so. Uh, the unemployment rates in major cities, particularly Detroit and others, is extremely high. The fact that we cannot get uh, an infrastructural development bill to hire folk all across this country, black and white, is ridiculous, is ludicrous, when that used to be the norm. Let me also suggest this, that when you look at Detroit and when you look at Flint, and I have to make the parallel uh, relative to government responsibility and accountability, the parallels are striking. Uh, the, the, the same kind of core reasons for a lack uh, of infusion of capital and resources and listening to people and hearing what they're saying, putting in money, are still there's costing too much. Well, look at what, how much it's going to cost to repair Flint right now. Think in terms of what it's going to cost to fix the Detroit public school system if you don't seize and take the opportunity now. We already have the lessons there. The questions are, do we have the will to make the changes? Some of us do. Too many of us don't. And the real question is when we leave here, what are we going to do when we have our boardroom meetings and our meetings with our senior staff? I, I, I mentioned the DTE model because it's a good model. DTE sends their executives into the community. Matter of fact, um, uh, to be told, they, their senior executives didn't meet downtown uh, in the hotel, in the headquarters, that's fine, but they brought them in the neighborhood on Outer Drive. Their senior staff, a whole lot of them ain't never been to a black church, but they came to church. Uh, I gave them some chicken and some greens. And so, I mean, it was, it was, it was real good. But, but I'm saying that to say that it is a way of connecting and touching the people that you do business with, the people that you service. It's a model. And I'm simply saying, if there is the will, that's not to say we have not made progress because we have. But, but we, you talked about it before we came out here. This whole notion of not wanting to deal with the racial question and people wanting to back up. But y'all, if we don't talk about it, we can't deal with it. Uh, we're not going to bite you or hurt you. Or do, you talk about it when we ain't around. Let's talk about it when we are around to the degree that we can make some sensibility out of the things that you know confront all of us. We can be friends. We can, do, we can beat this if we have the will to do this. What is the biggest conflict in the story that's told about 1967? I mean, everybody has their version, right. their version of truth, I think they said in the video clip. So what's the version of truth that you've heard where you said that's completely the opposite of how I see it? Well, I mean, I think the, sto the, no the notion that it was a race riot 
We had a race riot in Detroit in 1943. Yes. Black people went after white people based on rumors, and white people went after black people based on rumors. That is a race riot. What happened in 67 was a rebellion against, I mean, outrageous police conduct that didn't stop in 67. What happened in 67 led to the creation of the stress unit, the infamous stress unit in the early 70s. They actually de developed a coalition that elected the first black mayor in Detroit. Sure. Stress killed 22 people in 18 months, 20 of whom were African American, that, and then there were 19 non-fatal shootings. People's lives were lost at the hands of police officers supposedly designed to maintain social order. Not linking up and not understanding that role or having the, having the view that the police were there to save the neighborhood or the community from the rioters is to miss the point. It was outright police brutality. And then to not, under, not appreciate the connection between the housing policies in the, both in the city and the suburbs right. that literally said people of color, black people cannot live in these neighborhoods was a huge movement, a movement the vestiges of which I believe we still live with. Yeah. Residential racial segregation in this region has its roots in that era. Understanding, the, understanding that history gives us a chance to A, let it go, and B, move past it. And I, I do think uh, Reverend's point about what happens in the inner circles, when you look at lots of people doing lots of good things here, when you look at leadership teams, why do you see them? I see this. Leadership teams for certain projects, everybody's African American. Leadership teams for projects, everybody's white. Can we figure this out so that we can actually get teams that are racially integrated. Sebastian, who are the young leaders that you look to? You know, you're talking about teams with leaders. I mean, to me, that's, OK, someone says, how do we create those teams? Who, who list for me the young leaders that you, as a young man under 30, looks to, you and your, your, your friends? Yeah. Um, just going back really quick, though, I think what, what, what Reverend said about infrastructure was important, right? Um, Damon mentioned it earlier, OPM, other people's money, other people's management, other people's you know, marketing, so on and so forth. I think that these large corporations like Chanola, for example, have to look at what's happening in the community and really start to work with some of these smaller businesses uh, that are influential. And that's what we're doing with them right now. Like, global culture is led by American culture. American culture is led by black culture. And I think it's very important that uh, that's seen in these businesses. Some businesses are popping up, and there's this sense that we don't belong, almost. Um, and I've seen people walk by these businesses and feel uncomfortable going in them because there's this sense of, I don't see myself there, uh, so I can't come in. So I think it's, I think it's very important uh, for some of these brands to work with uh, some of these smaller businesses that are influential. Uh, some of the leaders that I, I kind of look to uh, people like Jason Hall, people like Dennis Archer Jr., um, people that are, are, are literally uh, kind of opening their door and asking me, you know, I, I see what you're doing, what do you need, how can I help? Um, that needs to happen uh, more often. Yeah. And I would also say, in line with that, that that's very important because, because you need both the youth and those who are in the movement of tenure. When you got uh, strength of youth and wisdom of the tenure, then you got a strong program there. I, I would also say that um, for those corporations that have blacks uh, in their companies and in your public relations or community relations, if they ain't telling you the real deal, you don't need them. If they're telling you everything that makes you feel good, you can't use them because they are not telling you the right stuff. If they don't bring you something that makes you mad or upset, uh, then you don't need them. They need to be telling you exactly what's happening on the street. Uh, not about keeping their job because they work for a dime a dozen. You can, get, you can get any one of them any day. But you need somebody that's going to bring you the real stuff about what's happening in the street and what's, what's not happening. I would simply say this. Uh, when I think of uh, individuals who are trying to make a difference, uh, Dennis was mentioned and some other folk. I see Tanya Allen here, Hiram Jackson. It's, it's a bunch of young people, uh, young men and women in private sector and in business and nonprofits who are doing great things. But the question is, we still have a challenge. And I don't want anyone to, live here, to leave here with any illusion that all is not. I remember in 67, as an example, uh, being on Linwood and Buena Vista. That's where we live. And when that stuff hit a 
off. Um, I remember that night. I remember the tanks coming down Linwood. I remember the police uh, coming and standing with long shotguns in front of the doors. I remember looking out of my window in my living room and a police officer taking a long rifle and pointing at me. I'll never forget this, pointing at me just like this as if he was getting ready to shoot me. All I was doing was looking out my window. But I also remember uh, George Romney uh, coming down the street in short sleeve shirts talking to the folk, engaging the community. I remember that. I remember the fact uh, that through the uh, HUD, Housing Urban Development Program, I remember the programs that came out of D.C. Uh, following, I remember the, the birth of New Detroit. That's why New Detroit came about, because of the lack of inclusion, racial and economic, and there's still a need for a new Detroit relative to the implementation of what we say we want to be about. So the challenge is still before us. Barack Obama, as good as he has been and has tried to, to, to be, ain't resolved the issue for us. We still are catching hell. There might be some heaven in the White House, and I doubt that, but we're still catching some hell in our own house. That is, relates to the police departments across the country, the educational systems across the country, the lack of the ability to get banks to really look at economic development with black businesses like they do all the other businesses because they still ain't got the memo that we should not have to sell our life's blood and give up our babies and our mamas and daddies in order to get a loan. They ain't got that memo yet. So they need to get the memo that if we're really going to have an economic development in our communities, they need to get on board. Some have gotten it, but not enough. Seb, let me ask you a question about the model that Detroit could be. Is this a national model, do you think? I mean, as you know, clearly you read the Kerner Commission report and you think this could have been written two weeks ago, right? And we still are grappling with the very same things. Yep. Um, could the changes here be a model for the nation? Absolutely. There are ways in which Detroit is already beginning right. to leapfrog other parts of the country, um, whether it be some of the things that we see going on in linked learning, the effort mm -hmm. that Sheila referred to, to connect young people to sectors that are growing, right. so you're not being trained for a job that didn't exist, you're actually moving into opportunity. That is an extremely important effort, yep. and it is scalable. Right. It's not a boutique little thing to help 200 kids. It is a large-scale effort, and it should be bigger, and others should, should get involved. There are things like that. There are things like uh, the way uh, community development and housing finance can work. And I want to say something else about race and racial leadership. I don't mean to put Detroit on a pedestal, nor do I have um, a crystal ball. But if Detroit is to be a model, it needs to look backward into the future, a la the conversation we're having, in a way that also acknowledges that it's firmly a multiracial city now, not just a biracial city. So to have this conversation in a way that is broadly and deeply inclusive and acknowledges the particular experiences in the black community, the white community, Hispanic, Asian, and so on, while building that leadership that crosses lines going forward, um, it's not as though there's been a, great, a gate crashing on that front, not as though there are a dozen other models around right. you know, nationwide. So that's a real opportunity for the city. I also think what benefits that a bit, Zaz, is that, that my daughter's 30, and her thing to me is, Mom, you guys, you're so stuck on 67. Every, you know, you see the world through, if you're from Detroit or from the area, it, it, that was an event that, you know, sort of changed the p course of people's lives, people's views of themselves, their neighborhoods. The thing is, you know, it's, it, yes, bad things happened and it was really important, but we have to get past that. Uh, and I think that the, 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 the generational conversation about race, there is a generational conversation about race, and the younger generation is going to be able to uh, take things, to move in a, in, a, in a direction that is less encumbered by our history. Part of it is because we really haven't worked through that, what that history means. Does that bring you concern? You know, I'm always worried when everyone's sort of ready to move on because I think we're a very forgetful people as Americans, and then it's very easy for, for that history to sort of dis, disappear altogether. You know, America, I, yes. I believe, has this very, um, the idea that racism is deeply embedded in American history and American culture is very upsetting to a lot of people. Just, you know, they don't, they don't want to sit in that fact, as, and no matter how many examples come their direction. So right. I worry in my own children who are teenagers that moving forward is both great 
and it worries me as well. I agree with you 100%. Part, to me, part of it is we, we, there has to be, and I think you're beginning to see nationally anyway, I see some beginning real conversation, a really tough one for white people to have, white privilege. What does white privilege mean? That's an idea that we as white people really don't address often. I think that conversation is coming. I think it's part of you know, being able to really look back to move forward is to get to that point. Institutional white racism set the stage, maintained the conditions that created the events that happened in 67. We have to own that, but we can move past it if we own it. And I think, and I agree with that, we can move past it, but you gotta first acknowledge it. Uh, to the degree that I, I think W.E.B. Dewar called not white privilege, he called it the wage of whiteness, meaning that you start off with an extra wage because of that. <clears throat> we accept that, and for black folk, it is black acquiescence to the degree that this is our lot, we're just gonna be like this. Snoop Dogg, uh, one of the great philosophers of the day, uh, has said, <laughs> has, has recently articulated the fact that we don't need to have another slave movie made. Uh, as if uh, there are not movies made that support and that uh, grandize and give accolades to black traditions, the movies on race, the movies, the documentaries, the various films that we've seen. But here's a guy, uh, unfortunately, in that age category, who said, we have enough movies on that, we don't need to have another movie on that, but yet he has all kind of CDs and DVDs on belittling black women and black babies and black boys. I mean, come, come on, Snoop. I mean, get the shizzle stizzles in, in this kind of pizzle. <laughs> I'm simply saying that there's Are we a whole, rolling on this? There, there's, <laughs> a whole, there, there, there's a whole lot of folk who take that position, but I don't think that, that we should acquiesce to that. I think we should learn from the past mm -hmm. in order to prepare and to organize for the future. I don't want to stay in the past to the degree mm -hmm. that we didn't do it back then. I don't look through, the, uh, through Detroit through the lens of 67. I look at it through the lens of 2016. When I see 2016 and look through that lens, I see a lack of access still that needs to be overcome. I see the challenge of an educational system that is still suffering and children being held hostage because politicians can't get it. That's 2016. I see a Flint city where babies are dying and poisoned because of the lack of effectiveness and the lack of the will of government to make a change. I see, that's a 2016 lens. I see somebody running for president talking about, let's go back, make America great again. Well, what point in America are you talking about? Mm -hmm. Was that before I became free? Was that before uh, the civil rights? What, what the hell are you talking about? We talking right. about make America great again. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying, when I, look, when I look through the lens of Detroit or at the, at the nation, I'm looking through a 2016 lens, not a 1967 lens. Here's another thing I wonder, though, and I totally hear the Reverend on this, and Sheila and others. So we want to learn our history in part so that we're not doomed to repeat it. Yes. Right. We sort of learn all, all that at the dinner table. At least we're taught that, you know, that outlook. But it's important that each generation learn it and have a chance to talk about it. Um, I think it's important as a literate person in America that everyone have some understanding of, let's say, the difference between prejudice and privilege. They're not the right. same thing. Absolutely. An unearned advantage and acting with prejudice are not the same thing. But you've got to be able to understand both and, and what they do to create the world that we live in and to make possible change. But the other thing I wonder is, can you do all of that but also look at the problems right in front of us right now today in 2016, not just policing, but things as, again, forgive me, but as unsexy as transit. Yes. Mm. Poor folk in Detroit right. cannot get to work, True. Right. cannot get to hospitals, to civic amenities, these kinds of things. This region, this region lags the entire country. It's the only right. major urban region in America that does not have a decent regional transit system. Right. And we have a strategy. That is appalling. Yeah. That's criminal. The history of transit in America yes. is such a, would be such a riveting documentary, Absolutely. frankly, because it involves all it of does. sort of the story of the entire. It and, does. and when you pitch that story, people roll their eyes and I can say, imagine. <laughs> and, and I'd and rather I stab I myself in the eye with a fork. And I agree with my brother. It is. It is. And, and one of the things that needs to happen is that as we repair and do transportation, as we build bridges, the people who live in the local community should be a part of those developments. Absolutely. They should have the jobs. They should be a part of that. Absolutely. But one of the problems with getting the jobs is the lack of training, which means that we have, you focus hope can't right. train everybody. Yes, yes. That means there has to be another focus on some other areas of training. Let me just say this. Do you know what the largest industry is in the new South Africa? The largest job industry in the new South Africa, after Mandela, after coming through apartheid, is the security industry. Huh. Security, that means police, personal private security. Why? Because folk want to protect what they got. Mm -hmm. The haves against the have-nots. 
We don't need to be like that or to do that in America or in Detroit. We need to be a part of protecting everybody to the degree that everybody participates uh, in the benefits of what we have done. Sheila, I learned. jumped in on you before you were about to say something. Well, I, I, I'm sort of lost the train of thought here, but I, I, a couple things. One, when I was looking at some stuff before we came here today, it really was noteworthy to me that the Greater Detroit Chamber, or a Greater Detroit Board of Commerce, in 19, late 1967, literally put out a plan to address what was felt to be one of the key problems that led to 1967, and that was job creation. I mean, the chamber literally back then understood was, and that, that jobs were really part of the answer. I think also the role the New Detroit played. I see um, Joe Hudson here, who played a really key role in, in the creation of New Detroit, an honest attempt um, to begin to address some of these disparity issues. But at the end of the day, we still all need to appreciate that disinvestment and deindustrialization set the stage for people experiencing the kind of, of uh, brutality that the police department handed out. And, and really quick, you know, I don't think our generation uh, is, it doesn't appreciate the past. I think that we just understand that it was a moral issue, and it still is a moral issue, and it's not much that we can do to shift people's morals. Um, I think that we're looking at the tools that we have now through social media, through the internet, so on and so forth, to, to, to try to level the playing field a bit and just kind of Netflix this old way of doing things like Blockbuster, right? Mm -hmm. So it's almost like if, if you're not willing to Disruption shift your morals, value. we're going to have to shift them for you okay. uh, by just taking, uh, uh, taking the front seat. So you're interesting you raise that, and I'll leave this as my final question then. What happens in terms of policy? You talk about it sort of as a, a moral issue, and we have listed a number of things. But if you had to pick one, if I said, give me the one thing that as a policy should be the focus to move things, lesson learned, moving forward, what is it? It, it fixed the education system. OK, right education. Now. That's education. Education training deals with, touches everything. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to say inclusive economic growth. And it starts with education, but it includes things like transit. How do you make an economy work without people being able to connect to jobs and education? Right. I, I agree with both what Reverend said and, and as Zaz said, it, it's, it's all of it. Yeah. yeah, education and access to capital. Um, uh, I mean, education is, is, is huge. Uh, having access to capital, uh, having programs that help you know, our communities, you know, build credit, so on and so forth, to have access to capital that is out there. Um, there there's money coming down the pipeline that is specifically set aside for our community, but if we can't get access to that um, because of other issues, uh, it doesn't matter that we have access to that capital. I love a panel when you ask them to name one, they each name two. That's <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. And if you don't know something, ask somebody, yeah. and they can help you. Great. Great. A big round of applause for our panel, please. Thank you, guys.